This lecture is on products liability, and in particular, I want to illustrate the analysis of a products liability problem uh, in its entirety. Now, there's all the things that you might write about a products liability problem. Uh, so I'm going to give the entire structure of the analysis. You do not necessarily need to use uh, the entire structure that I'm going to show you for every products liability problem. You need to look at what you ask and so forth. But let's put the whole thing on the board so you can see it. So to illustrate the analysis of this class of problems, I need to uh, have a fact pattern. And uh, here are my facts. Uh, Peter went to a retailer, bought a car, uh, drove the car to his girlfriend's house named Gail, parked the car in her garage, and uh, during the night the gasoline from the, from the car uh, had leaked onto the ground. The destroy and uh, the whole place caught fire. Nobody died. Everyone, no personal injury. But Gail's house was destroyed. The car that Peter just bought was destroyed. And by the way, Peter had a twenty-five thousand dollar guitar. He's a famous musician, and his twenty-five thousand dollar guitar was in the trunk of the car. So the guitar is destroyed. The car is destroyed, and Gail's house is destroyed. Uh, how did this happen? The way it happened is that. Uh, when the car was designed, uh, the, one of the gas lines at the lower part of the car came down low enough, close enough to the ground, so that if the car runs over certain kinds of bumps uh, in just the right circumstances, the gas line can get snagged or torn or punctured. And that's what happened. When Peter was on his way home from the retailer, Peter ran over a, a bump that happened to meet these criteria, Gas line got damaged when he parked the car in her garage. It leaked gas onto the floor, and that's how the place caught fire. Uh, and everything's destroyed. And so now comes the lawsuits. And uh, 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 Peter is going to sue, and Gail is going to sue. And let's go through the analysis of those lawsuits. Uh, now, you know the facts, uh, so I won't... Uh, Put the facts on the board again. I'll just summarize them very quickly. Peter is the plaintiff bought the car from retailer. Retailer is going to get sued. Peter uh, bought a car from retailer. The car had this gas line uh, too close to the ground on the way to Gail's house. The gas line broke. Uh, Peter didn't know anything about it. Leaked. The gas leaked. House burned down. Guitar destroyed. Car destroyed. Gail's house destroyed. Uh, and uh, the car was made by, manuf by, uh, a, uh, by, auto, by auto Inc. Who is the, uh, uh, so Auto Inc. made the car, sold it to retailer, retailer sold it to Peter, Peter parked it in Gail's garage. Those are the facts. And now comes the lawsuits. And I'm going to, uh... so our first lawsuit is uh, Peter Peter is going to sue, well, who is Peter going to sue? Peter certainly is going to sue the retailer. And Peter will sue the Auto Inc. who made the car. When Peter sues retailer, uh, he can sue retailer on three theories. Negligence, breach of warranty, and strict liability. When Peter sues retailer, uh, when Peter sues Auto Inc., Peter will likewise sue Auto Inc. for uh, negligence breach of warranties, and strict liability. When Peter sues retailer for negligence, breach of warranty, and strict liability, uh, remember that in strict liability, there are two sources of the strict liability obligation. So, uh, mo almost all states have adopted the second restatement, and some have adopted, many have now adopted the third restatement. So the strict liability rule can be the one in the second restatement or the one in the third restatement. We have to do both analysis on the bar. 
for the barn. So, uh, so we, uh, so for both the, when we sue auto ink, we'll sue auto ink for negligence, breach of warranty, and on the strict liability, second restatement, and third restatement, do the analysis, do both of them. <clears throat> so those are the lawsuits that Peter will bring. Let's see how far we'll get with these lawsuits. Peter sues retailer for negligence. Well, the retailer of this car uh, did not have any reason to know about this conflict. And so we're not going to get any place with a suit for negligence against the retailer. So we'll just put a big no here. Next, breach of warranties. Well, what warranties do we have? The warranties that we have are the uh, warrant are two dash UCC two dash three thirteen. Those are the express warranties, and there were no express warranties by the retailer in this problem. And the other warranties are two dash three fourteen, which are the implied warranties. Every commercial seller is impliedly warranting that the product is fit for ordinary use and all those things we've talked about. And so there are, so yes, we can say that this product is not fit for ordinary use because of the problem that I told you about. So yes, so the, we have no lawsuit under 2-313. Yes, we have a cause of action under 2-314, breach of that warranty. And then still sticking with the retailer, we sue the retailer for a strict liability under uh, the second restatement. Uh, the second restatement, we use the consumer expectation as our primary test. Was this product more dangerous than a reasonable consumer would expect? And so you would uh, uh, discuss that under the second restatement, the consumer expectation test. And then under the third restatement, uh, what you must do always under the third restatement is to say that uh, every product, every defect under the third restatement m m is, must either be a manufacturing defect or a design defect or a failure to warn defect. That's the only kind they are. And so if you're claiming that this car that we just talked about is defective, you must classify it as either a manufacturing defect or a design defect or a, uh, or a uh, failure to warn. Now in our case, uh, this car uh, with a, with a uh, gas line that comes too close to the ground, uh, it's not a manufacturing defect because we know the definition of a manufacturing defect. It's a product which is which departs from the intended design. This, the car was, didn't come off the assembly line different from the other cars. So it's not a manufacturing defect. Is it a design defect? So the answer to manufacturing defect here is going to be no. Um, the design defect, do we have a design defect? Well, remember in the design defect that the question is, could the risk have been reduced by uh, a reasonable alternative design, and did the omission of that reasonable alternative design make the product not reasonably safe? Not reasonably safe. And so you apply that here and you have to just use that, and whether or not there was a reasonable alternative design is a big deal. And we talked about that on this lecture. Okay, so uh, under when you sue the retailer, we have a uh, uh, lawsuit under two, uh, no negligence under breach of warranty, 2-314, yes. Strict liability, consumer expectation, yes. We have a lawsuit under the second restatement against the retailer. Third restatement, uh, we, uh, it's not a manufacturing defect. You would argue that it is a design defect because clearly there are reasonable uh, alternative designs and you do explain that fully, talk about the cost and the... Uh, whether or not it's within the state of the art to put that pipe, put that gas line up higher so it's further from the ground, that's certainly within the state of the art 
talk about the cost of doing it, the utility, how much danger does it create, and so there was a reasonable alternative design. Then the uh, uh, failure to warn, well, this is not a failure to warn case because they didn't even know about it. Those are the suits against the retailer. Now comes the Auto Inc. You sue Auto Inc. Negligence. Well, yes, you can bring a, uh, I'm sorry, under this, under, when you're suing the retailer under the third restatement, we do not have a manufacturing design. We probably do have a, a, a design. We do not have a manufacturing defect. We probably do have, I just want to put these notes on the board, we do have a, probably do have a design defect and the failure to warn, we do not have a failure to warn defect. Okay. Okay, so uh, that completes our lawsuit against retailer. Now we come to the Auto Inc. We're going to sue Auto Inc. for negligence. Well, uh, when you designed uh, the car in that way, uh, can't you make an argument that it's foreseeable that someone's going to get injured uh, and it's, uh, uh, in, you, I mean, there, in other words, I'm saying that this design was done negligently because a, uh, this is a, you can establish by, uh, uh, by uh, any of the negligence methods. You can, you can establish it by, for example, uh, the, the balancing test. You can say it's so easy to have designed this safer and they didn't do it and it, it, it creates a substantial risk of great bodily harm or death that's negligent conduct then causation damages defenses. So uh, you can argue, argue negligence here against them, yes. Breach of warranty against Auto Inc, same warranties. Uh, there was no 2-313 warranty because there were no express warranties. The 2-314 warranty, yes. So 2-313 uh, uh, is a no, because there were no express warranties. 2-314 is a yes, because it's a yes, because there were implied warranties. And now strict liability against the Auto Inc. Secondary statement. You apply the uh, consumer expectation test, and I think you have a good claim there. And then under the third restatement, again, you break it up into manufacturing, design, and failure to warn. Now, what I want you to see here, I mean, it's clear to you how you do this, but there are two final important points I want to make. Uh, one is that I want you to see that a lot of this analysis is duplicated. Uh, when you sue the retailer for strict liability, the analysis for strict liability of the retailer is exactly the same as the analysis for the strict liability of Auto Inc. So you don't need to repeat that analysis, just you know, do a quick explanation of why they're the same. Uh, the breach of warranty by the retailer and the breach of warranty by Auto Inc., those are exactly the same. So make use of that in your writing. And then the last point that I want to make is that uh, for each of these lawsuits, if you were literally bringing this lawsuit against somebody in court and you said, these people were negligent, uh, you would not just say to the court, these people were negligent. Okay, you, gotta, you can't do that. You'd have to say, these people were negligent and causation and damages and they would bring on their defenses. So I'm saying this causation, damages, and defenses, so many people tend to leave it out. Don't leave it out of your analysis. Take the points. And so uh, for the, for in your first cause of action, for example, here, when Peter sues the retailer, Peter sues the retailer the, uh, uh, under, uh, uh, sorry, Peter sues the retailer, uh, and you show the breach of warranty, you've got to do your causation and uh, uh, damages and, and look for defenses. Now, uh, I said that was the last thing, but actually that's not quite true because we've still got Gale. Uh, and uh, we've got to, uh, we have a little issue here uh, that we haven't talked about. Let's talk about that issue right now, then we will be done. The issue that I want to talk about here is right here at 2 313 314 
when the Peter sues the retailer for a breach of the warranty that the product is fit for its intended purpose, 2-314, sues the retailer, implied warranty, 2-314. Peter says, when I bought this car from you, you made these warranties to me, because I'm the purchaser, and you made the warranty uh, directly to me. So we don't have a privity, a horizontal privity problem. But when, uh, I mean, you can put it in here, that you do you put the privity problem right here, the, the first time you come up with 2-314, when Peter sues the retailer for violation of 2-314, implied warranties, Peter says, I am in privity of contract with you, and therefore the promises about these goods were made to me. And so there's no problem with the privity. And remember that the, the privity of 2-318, uh, A, B, and C, is the way the UCC handles the privity problem. And it says, certainly the purchaser is in privity, in our case, Peter is in privity with the retailer. But the real problem is going to come up is when Gale tries to recover. And when Gale tries to recover, uh, Gale is not in privity nor with, the, with the retailer. So she tries to recover, now, not under the strict liability or breach of warranty, she's clearly a foreseeable, pardon me, under negligence or strict liability, she's clearly a foreseeable plaintiff. But in the case of the promises that come out of these uh, uh, warranty cases, so you gotta, uh, the, the person is making a promise to the purchaser, and to whom else is he making that promise? And that's a different problem. And so here the retailer was obviously making the promise to, uh, uh, to, the, to the purchaser. So 2-318 says that when you, these implied promises that the retailer is making, that the law says you're making them at least to the purchaser, and so that takes care of Peter. So Peter is in privity and can sue for breach of warranty. Or on the other hand, a Gale is not, a, uh, uh, not the purchaser. So when Gale wants to sue for breach of warranty, can she sue for breach of warranty? The question really is when the uh, retailer or manufacturer were making these implied warranties, making these implied promises, were they making promises to Obviously, they're making promises to the purchaser, but were they making promises to her? She's the person where the car was parked. And the answer is that uh, the, it depends on uh, uh, 2-318. 2-318, if the jurisdiction has adopted the A version, then the purchaser and the purchaser's household and guest. And would that include Gail? I don't know. Uh, uh, item, if your jurisdiction adopted B, then the, the promises are being made to all those people who might foreseeably be injured by the use of the product. And so uh, that's a little broader, but these are still just for personal injuries. Both, both A and B are for personal injury only. And uh, Peter wasn't personally injured and Gail wasn't personally injured. So, even if, so, the, uh, so Gail really couldn't sue under 2-318A uh, because there's no personal injury. Gail could not sue under 2-318B because there's no personal injury. And um, uh, so her suing for breach of warranty is gonna be a real problem. When Peter was suing, uh, let's come back here because we left out some stuff here. When Peter was suing for breach of warranty under 2-314, Peter is obviously the purchaser, but what I wanna point out is that uh, the uh, Peter's personal, Peter can recover for his personal injury, but not his property damage. And so if the jurisdiction has adopted 2-318A or B, so unless they have adopted C, he can't really recover for his property damage, his guitar, his uh, $25,000 guitar that's in the trunk, his property damage that resulted from the breach of warranty, and that property damage cannot be recovered by Peter unless the jurisdiction has adopted the 2-318C. Uh, there, and um, so uh, this suit of 2-314 that I said they could bring, well, they can in the sense that the, there's a breach of warranty by the, uh, uh, by the retailer because the product wasn't fit for ordinary use, but that breach of warranty will allow Peter or Gail to collect for personal injury. There wasn't any, but 
not property damage <clears throat> unless the jurisdiction has adopted the C version of 2-318. Okay, so that's very important here. Also, when Peter sues Auto Inc. under 2-314, um, we have that Auto Inc. did indeed make the warranties and did breach the warranty. So Auto Inc. has breached the warranty, but the warranty is being made for personal injury and to the purchase under 2-318A or B or C. And there's no personal injury. And so although you have a breach of warranty that you really will not succeed in this lawsuit uh, against Auto Inc. for property damage. Now, um, the, uh, so when Gail sues, Gail is once removed, but, and, but neither Gail nor neither Gail nor Peter have personal injury. So when they try to sue under the breach of warranty and they don't have personal injury, they're not going to succeed unless the jurisdiction has adopted 2-318C. Okay. Um, the final comment I want to make is, please, uh, if you're doing this lawsuit in real life and you, you sued for every wrong that you claim that the defendant committed, you would claim, you would say, and that wrong caused injury to my client, and here are the injuries. So don't forget the causation damages. If you, uh, uh, if you try to put all, you, you have several kinds of wrongs that the defendant did. The defendant breached a promise, and the defendant put a defective product into the stream of commerce, and the defendant acted negligently. You got all these kinds of different wrongs, and that uh, you, and you should do the causation separately. So that for, uh, as, uh, uh, for each wrong, you're saying that wrong was the cause of this damage. And for each of those, do them separately. But be sure to put the causation of damages. And don't forget defenses. The bar examiners almost always put some kind of defenses available there. So when you bring the warranty suit, watch out for you know, uh, uh, limitations on remedies and uh, 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 disclaimers and that sort of thing. Uh, when you bring a suit... Uh, and the, the danger in, in strict liability. And uh, the, the product was defective, but the danger was obvious, and the person went ahead and did it anyway. Well, you may have some contributory negligence, and that's a partial defense. So don't forget those partial defenses or full defenses. Okay, so the way, again, the way you analyze these, uh, um, these uh, products liability problems is that here, quick summary, Peter is suing retailer and Auto Inc. When Peter sues retailer, they'll sue for negligence. It did not happen. They sue for breach of warranty. This won't work because he has no personal injury. Uh, the strict liability use the second restatement and the third restatement. Under the second restatement, the basic standard is consumer expectation test. If uh, Peter sues a retailer for violation of the consumer expectation test, he ought to win. If Peter sues under the third restatement, break it out the, the, re, the uh, defect in the manufacturing design and failure to warn and do those separately. And the same thing against the suit, Auto Inc. And finally, when Gale sues, that is when Peter sues Auto Inc. is pretty much the same thing, except Auto Inc. might be negligent. Uh, and finally, when Gale sues, uh, uh, Gale uh, can, uh, when Gale sues, she can sue the retailer, but the retailer wasn't negligent. Gail uh, can sue the retailer for breach of warranty, but again, uh, there is no personal injury, and so she's not really going to be covered by that unless the jurisdiction has adopted the C version of 2-318. And when Gail can sue under the second and third restatements, you get basically the same results, because she is a foreseeable plaintiff. And when Gail sues Auto Inc., Gail sues Auto Inc., the, uh, the suit will be basically the same, except that again, under warranty, Unless she has personal injury, she cannot win that, or, uh, unless, she, uh, or unless the jurisdiction has adopted 2-318C. That's the structure, the organization, the way that uh, you should do these products liability problems. Uh, there are a lot of uh, repetition. These problems tend to be long because if for every defendant in the problem, you've got all of these, these claims that you can make against that defendant, and if you put a couple of defendants or a couple of plaintiffs, you can see that the number of claims get to be enormous. But uh, watch for duplicates and, and be efficient when that happens. 
And the truly final comment I want to make is that if Peter wants to recover for the destroyed car, which was the very item that was purchased, he cannot recover for the destroyed car under either negligence or strict liability or the breach of warranty theory. You have to go to the sales transaction that Peter made with the retailer, and in that sales transaction there will be provisions for repair uh, of the car, replacement of the car, and that sort of thing. And that's where you go. You don't try to recover for the damaged product itself under products liability theories. You recover them under these other theories. And that is the end of this lecture on how to do products liability problems.